it happens so often to look at interviews with famous athletes and hear that the secret to their success is the fierce passion that they feel for their sport. I'm totally passionate about climbing and I just love it. And there are very, very few moments when I tell myself, ah, right now I just don't want to climb. Yeah, I mean, I am, uh, I don't really, I just want to climb. I'm, uh, I'm in love with climbing and uh, I just enjoy what I'm doing. I do it because I love it. But in reality, 75% of the population state that they feel at least moderate passion towards one activity. This means that passion alone cannot explain success. Not only there are cases in which passion took coaches and athletes astray. A very infamous case is Bobby Knight's ending of coaching career because of violent behavior against his own athletes. And the honor is shooting the technicals. Look at here, look at here. Bobby Knight just threw his chair clear across the free throw lane. Now, before going forward, try answering these statements. I'll give you a bit of time, but stop the video now so that you can take all the time that you need to answer these questions. This is a scale for harmonious and obsessive passion. I know the questions are quite transparent, but if you were honest, I think that it provides you a good idea of how strong harmonious and obsessive passion are in your field and within you. To do that, you can make the sum of the scores that you gave for the first seven items. And that is your score for the harmonious passion. And you do the same for the final seven statements. And that is for obsessive passion. I cannot tell you how you score uh, within the, the general population because it depends on many different things but it gives you quite an idea of how strong one is and the other is and how they interplay with each other. The most agreed definition comes from Valerand which is one of the most influential researchers on this topic. Passion can be seen as a strong inclination towards a specific object, activity, concept or person that one loves or at least strongly likes, highly values, invests time and energy on a regular basis and that is part of one's identity. Furthermore, two forms of passion seem to exist. The first can be seen as being in harmony with other aspects of the self and the person's life and should mainly lead to adaptive outcomes. The second form of passion may conflict with aspects of the self and life and should mainly lead to less adaptive and sometimes even maladaptive outcomes. From this definition, we can firstly say that passion is not a trait. Passion is not just mere enthusiasm that you can have for many different aspects of your life or activities, anything. No. Passion is a state and is highly specific to an object, person, activity, whatever. So it's not something that you're born with and it's something can be developed by anyone. The second element is that passion involves profound and enduring love. So it's not enough to engage frequently or even daily with an activity. You must be profoundly in love with it. Then the activity is highly valued. It is considered really important to the point that it is actually integrated into one's identity. What does it mean? It is the difference when you're saying, I am uh, climbing, I do climbing and I am a climber. The, the difference is that you identify with this role. And this signifies that you have given an extremely high value to the activity. Passion is a motivational rather than an effective process. 
We know that emotions are brief, while passion is much long lasting. You can be passionate about something for a week, which is still much longer than an emotion, because uh, when an emotion is, uh, is lasting longer, that becomes also a mood. But you can also be passionate for years, decades, a lifetime with an activity. And it's also considered a motivational process because it's the source of psychological energy. It's something that allows a very high level of persistence and effort. And as I said before, it is internalized in one's identity. And this means that the activity is extremely important. The lack of activity of the activity is um, actually affecting. Uh, is a threat for one's identity. If you are not allowed or you're not able to do this activity for a long period of time, then it means that you're not expressing one part of yourself. And this can be profoundly difficult to manage. This is one of the aspects why it's so hard to manage injuries, because you're forced not to do the activity that injured in the first place. And finally, as we said, it is dualistic. So there are these two components, harmonious and obsessive passion. So let's talk more a bit in details about these two components of what they actually mean. One of the most salient differences between harmonious and obsessive passion is that with obsessive passion, you feel an uncontrollable urge to do the activity. Instead, with harmonious passion, you actively engage and freely choose to engage in the activity. In fact, harmonious passion rises from the autonomous internalization of the activity into the identity. What does it mean? It means that you actively and freely choose to engage in the activity without any need for contingency. And one of the most important contingencies that I think that people don't think about is performance. You do not just simply engage with the activity because you feel that you're good at it. It's something that you do irrespectively of how you perform, even if you are injured and you are not able to climb hard stuff that make you feel like you're improving or that you're strong or your ability is good compared to other peers or to what you think you can consider good you would still be climbing and you would be still enjoying the process contrarily with obsessive passion you're not only integrating the activity into your identity but also the values and regulations that are attached to it for example, if you're very convinced that the activity is vital for your social acceptance or for maintaining a high self-esteem, it is likely that you will feel the relative lack of control over your activity. Or another example is when the excitement is so high that you just cannot resist it, that you cannot stay without that high. In these cases, it is possible that the activity will be in conflict with other important aspects of your life. Let's make an example. Let's pretend that I have to hand in, in a couple of days, a PhD assignment, and I'm very back on my schedule, which is way too likely. But I suddenly get invited to Solvik, which is the crag where my project is. And I just love projecting. Well, if I am experienced harmonious passion, I know that I shouldn't be going because I, I don't have much time to work on the assignments. I've been working out yesterday, so it's just okay not to go. There will be another occasion. But if I am experienced obsessive passion, then I just cannot resist the idea of missing out on this possibility, on this activity, and I will go. But at the same time, I will feel very angry no, but at the same time, I will be feeling very anxious because of the assignment and also guilty for not doing what I'm supposed to do. And this will not only impact my ability to finish the assignment on time, but will also impair my sensations when I'm climbing. I will be feeling grumpy. I will be feeling frustrated and this will overall impact the enjoyability of the session. 
So does it mean that obsessive passion is impairing performance? Well, not really. Both harmonious and obsessive passion showed uh, that they predict better performance. But obsessive passion only predicts poor well-being, stress and even chronic injuries. This, interestingly, happens even when we're statistically controlling for sport frequency. This means that the effect on the injuries and on the well-being is just not given by the fact that the athlete with obsessive passion is training more. I think that the fact that obsessive passion is also associated with performance is one of the main reasons why so many athletes are convinced that their obsession is actually good for them. While in the long run we know that obsessive passion is bad for our well-being. In fact, people with high obsessive passion also have an impaired ability to make strong and deep interpersonal relationships, which we know social support is extremely important for our, our well-being. So you notice that you really are into the obsessive passion loop. What can you do about it? Well, there are actually many studies that were conducted on coaches that show that autonomy supportive change oriented feedback interventions are really effective. But what can you do if you don't have the luxury of having a coach? Well, I think that we can take the main points of these interventions and try to apply them ourselves. There's an intervention that is based basically focusing on communication styles and type of feedbacks. So we could try to apply them with our self-talk and we could also try to surround ourselves with friends and people that reflect these communication strategies. First thing, try to be empathic with yourself. Try to understand your struggles and be self-compassionate. Self-compassion is not making you lazy. It's actually giving you what you need to be the most of yourself and enjoy the most of your activity. Avoid feedback modalities that are punishing. I'm afraid I'm going to be like really nitpicky. And every time I hear you say one of those like slightly, one of those phrases that would just drain your confidence a little bit, I'm just going to point it out. You want to, I was actually going to suggest like, yeah, okay, let's do a little like, I'll do them with you okay. so that I'm not just like punishing you, making you do loads of push-ups. Okay. Every- Threatening or inducing shame. Try to avoid person related statements and make them into situational statements. For example, try saying, I feel very tired today instead of I'm feeling very lazy today. Lazy is a person statement. It's your quality. If you feel like you're not good enough in dinos, instead of saying, I suck at dinos, say, I still have a lot to improve for dinos. But also when we're talking about something you're good at, instead of saying, I'm very good at slabs, try saying, I did really well on these slabs. This will prevent avoidance oriented coping strategies. If the activity is so important for your identity, it is highly probable that you will stay away from the things that you're not so good at, because it will be a threat for your uh, identity and for your self-esteem. Finally, actively ask people and friends for tips and suggestions. This not only will prompt social support, but it will also guide your short to medium term goal setting. Autonomous supportive interventions has been shown to be useful in many different aspects of sports, actually. And uh, also it showed that makes the activity much more enjoyable. If you're interested in these type of interventions, just let me know. I will try to make uh, more applied examples of these interventions if you are interested. In the meantime, drop a like, maybe drop a comment for the algorithm if you want to support me. And I will see you in the next video. Stay psyched. Finally, 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs>